In the history of movies, there are very few productions that were as troubled, some might even say cursed, as John Frankenheimer's The Island of Dr. Moreau. The subject of a feature-length documentary and reportedly a deathbed curse, the film opened and closed at the tail end of the summer of 1996, ending a couple of careers in its wake with the reported behavior of star Val Kilmer seemingly putting an asterisk next to his name for years to come, and more than likely contributing to his decline as a leading man. So, join us as we try to find out what the fuck happened to the island of Dr. Moreau. The film, of course, is based on the novel by H.G. Wells, which was written in 1896 and is a classic in the science fiction genre. In it, the eponymous doctor is a surgeon who performs painful experiments on animals in order to make them quote-unquote men, with his faithful assistant Montgomery, who feels sympathy for the beast people, while the story is told to the eyes of a castaway named Edward Prendick. The animal creatures are punished in The House of Pain, which, trivia, is how the famous rap band got their name. It was first adapted into a feature film in Island of Lost Souls, which starred Charles Lawton as Moreau, delivering a classic, iconic performance all iterations of the character would be measured against. A production of the pre-code era, the film was subsequently banned in many countries and nearly impossible to find, although it's now out through the Criterion Collection. Smaller, low-budget iterations followed before another big-budget version in 1977 starring screen icon Burt Lancaster as Moreau and Michael York as the castaway. But it was also the film that introduced the Panther Girl love interest, in a way. Originally, Barbara Carrera, who played Maria the love interest, was supposed to revert into a panther before the film's end, but reshooting changed that. Although the editing is so clunky on the film, it's very easy to spot the scene that would have revealed her ultimate fate. One of the few people to see that movie during its initial release was writer-director Richard Stanley. In the early 90s, he was a hot up-and-coming director, with his film Hardware winning many fans and its follow-up Dust Devil acquiring a cult following despite being shorn of 20 minutes for its American release by the Weinstein brothers. He was hot enough at the time that he was able to convince New Line Cinema to greenlight a big-budget adaptation of the book. Stanley's story is recounted in excruciating detail by the fascinating documentary Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island Dr. Moreau, which is available on Amazon Prime and Shudder. But the short version is this. New Line Cinema had just finished shooting Don Juan DeMarco with Marlon Brando, and they offered him the lead in Island of Dr. Moreau, despite the company head Bob Shea warning that it was a bad idea. The studio sought to fire Stanley before production even began and replace him with Roman Polanski, but Richard Stanley was able to convince them to allow him a meeting with Marlon Brando, who, against all odds, took a shine to Stanley. Stanley, in the dock, says a witch named Skip actually cast a spell to get him the film, and sure enough, for a while, everything fell into place nicely. Bruce Willis was signed to play the heroic lead, Prendick, who became a UN negotiator here. For the third lead, Moreau's assistant Montgomery, Stanley convinced James Woods to take the part. And with those three actors on board, Marlon Brando, Bruce Willis, and James Woods, the film's budget increased significantly. Here is where the real trouble began. At the time, Bruce Willis was going through a divorce with Demi Moore and was unable to leave the United States for six months, meaning that he had to drop out of the project. His replacement wound up being Val Kilmer, who was red hot coming off of his turn as the Cape Crusader in Batman Forever. Kilmer, who was in the midst of a storm of fame, suddenly changed his mind at the 11th hour and told the producers that he could no longer commit to the leading role, Prendick. So, in order to cut his shooting days, he was assigned the more minor role of Moreau's assistant, Montgomery. Farewell, James Woods. To play Prendick, they hired Rob Morrow, who was then starring on the TV show Northern Exposure and had a hit with Robert Redford's quiz show. For a while, it looked like things would work out until Kilmer's behavior became inexplicably erratic. Or perhaps it was explainable, with people behind the scenes saying he was simply an asshole, who, among other things, demanded co-star's lines be cut and burned a cameraman's sideburns with a lit cigarette because he thought it was funny. Many on the set dubbed him a classic prep school bully, and he had no patience for Stanley, who was essentially left on his own to battle with Kilmer, having little studio backup. The location was also pounded with bad weather, and Brando's daughter, Shane, had recently taken her own life, meaning his arrival on set would, understandably, be delayed. 
Co-star Rob Morrow, frustrated with the film, made a panicked call to Bob Shea begging to be released from the project, saying it was out of control, and they let him go. Sadly for Stanley, he also ended up being let go after the studio basically assigned all the blame for what was going wrong to him. Despite the fact that it sounds like it was nature and prima donna behavior from a cruel killer that did him in. His replacement would not have an easier time of it, but he was also not one to back down from a fight. His name? John Frankenheimer. By that point, Frankenheimer was already a legend, having directed a series of classics including The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, Black Sunday, Grand Prix, and more. He also famously took over for directors on The Train and Birdman of Alcatraz, and both movies went on to become classics. However, in 1996, his career had faltered, with a long series of flops including The Challenge, The Hullcraft Covenant, The Underrated 52 Pickup, and Dead Bang. At the time, he was mostly directing TV films. Frankenheimer likely saw this as his shot at re-establishing his movie career, and let's face it, despite his fearsome reputation, everyone wanted to work with Marlon Brando. Even Frankenheimer, with his Marnette attitude, found himself overwhelmed by his Moreau. Brando, when he eventually showed up, wanted to wear flowing white cheesecloth, and in another scene, wanted to wear an ice bucket as a hat. His reasoning? Moreau is actually a transformed dolphin, and the bucket is covering his blowhole. Frankenheimer, understandably, was not amused, but what could he do? Brando's lines would also be fed to him via radio transmitter in his ear. David Thulwis, who was Morrow's replacement as the heroic castaway lead, eventually claimed that Brando would be in the middle of a scene and suddenly he'd be picking up police messages and Marlon would repeat, there's a robbery at Woolworths. The German actor Marco Hofschneider, who was originally cast as Moreau's beast man valet M. Ling, was demoted because he couldn't understand Brando's attempts to speak German to him and in his place Nelson De La Rosa, the world's shortest man at 2 feet 4 inches, was cast as Moreau's minstrel. Apparently, De La Rosa's power went to his head with him allegedly punching Hofschneider in the balls when he said hello to him in an elevator. The problems with Brando, however, were minor compared to Frankenheimer's now legendary clashes with Val Kilmer. If Stanley had issues with him, Frankenheimer absolutely despised the man, telling everyone that even if he were filming a movie called The Val Kilmer Story, he'd still never cast that asshole. In his book, I'm Your Huckleberry, Kilmer says he was not to blame for any of the film's problems, including the sacking of Richard Stanley, and said that Frankenheimer simply used him as a scapegoat. In the documentary, Lost Soul, Phrygia Bulk said Frankenheimer was a bully himself, and that Brando was thoroughly uninterested in acting at this point, while others, including New Line bigwig Bob Shea, say Frankenheimer is the only reason they wound up with a finished film. Given the design of the Beast People, the actors involved would take hours to be made up and often they'd be called to the set all dressed up with nothing to do. One day, shooting never happened because neither Brando nor Kilmer would come out of their trailers. Perhaps not inexplicably, the Beast People, who were being paid hefty per diems, began acting out, turning the set into a never-ending party given that none of them were ever really asked to act or work. There were drugs, sex, booze, and money. But in perhaps the most legendary twist of all, Richard Stanley himself showed up on set and blended in with the Beast People, disguising himself with makeup to take his place among the costumed extras, only to unveil himself at the cast and crew party where, by all accounts, Val Kilmer apologized and embraced him. The film finally opened in the summer of 1996 to terrible reviews and only grossed $49 million worldwide on a $40 million budget. Yet, New Line was actually happy with the result as before Frankenheimer signed on, it looked like the film would be shut down. So. In the end, they minimized their losses. The film wound up leaving a lasting mark on the pop culture with Mini-Me in the Austin Powers movies based on De La Rosa's performance. For Frankenheimer, the film indeed was his comeback as it allowed him to land the Robert De Niro action flick Ronin, which was a sizable hit, leading to reindeer games for the Weinstein brothers before he passed away in 2002. Here's where the deathbed curse comes in. Urban legend has it that a prominent critic turned director was forced to swear a deathbred promise to Frankenheimer never ever to cast Kilmer in any of his future projects. The director has never confirmed this story, but the rumor persists. For Kilmer and Brando, the film would mark the end of their days as leading men. Kilmer's reputation became toxic, which followed him around for years, with Joel Schumacher telling everyone that the two clashed on Batman Forever while his behavior on The Ghost in the Darkness wasn't portrayed any more favorably in writer William Goldman's memoirs. He also apparently clashed so hard with Tom Sizemore on the set of Red Planet, a restraining order was filed against him, and before his ultimate illness, which resulted in tragic loss of his voice, 
Kilmer would be caught in a loop of DTV movies, although many say his behavior improved tremendously after his Hollywood reign as an A-lister. Kilmer did also explain that at the time he was going through a painful divorce, and perhaps in some ways that could explain his behavior. As for Brando, following his turn here, it would only be bit parts until he passed away in 2004. The happiest ending, ironically, would be reserved for Stanley, who found himself a second career directing documentaries before himself becoming the subject of a great one, the aforementioned Lost Soul. Eventually, he would return to directing with the acclaimed Color Out of Space, starring Nicolas Cage, who, as opposed to Brando and Val Kilmer, was, you know, the right kind of crazy. The nice kind of crazy. The fun kind of crazy. As for The Island of Dr. Moreau, it remains a footnote in the careers of Frankenheimer and Brando, while its behind-the-scenes legend has a lot more staying power than anything that ended up on the screen. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support. Thank you.